played nine games with the Bucks, and if the Eagles needed a guy for a few, he'd go back. <laughs> but a decade in the NFL, two Super Bowls, love him every year when he comes on. Uh, four years with the Patriots, Titans. You had really good coaches, by the way. Vrabels, Belichick, smart guys. Uh, Logan Ryan is joining us, a two-time Super Bowl champ. So there's a lot, first of all, there's a lot I want to dive into. I, I do want to go back to the Patriot years because we were talking during the break. Is that in college football, the margins in most games, if you're at a Georgia, Bama, Oklahoma, yeah. are greater. In the NFL, you know, Belichick introduces a left-footed punter. He wants different spin. And 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 you, we were talking about during the break. I said, you know, Logan, you've always been a think. You think the game, you just don't play it. Not every pro athlete does that. And you were you were uh, talking about the kind of discussions that Belichick would have. Give me the first one. I thought was fascinating. Yeah, I think the first one would be that we discussed is talking about the referees and knowing who the umpire is, knowing who the referees is, knowing what penalties they call the most, and if they're a, if they're a crew that doesn't major in defensive pass interference, doesn't major in defensive holding. We're going to try to do that a little bit more. I remember wearing gloves, the color of the uni- of the opponent's jersey, yep. wearing white gloves if they're wearing white on the road so we can get away with white gloves. They can't see the holding as much. And just kind of playing the game, right? What, what, what does the umpire look to call? And We're, we're not going to do that. If they're, if they're going to call a lot of holding, then Belichick might put boxing gloves on our hands during the week so we can't hold at all in practice. <laughs> so you're going to cover with your feet. So he just did some things I've never saw or never did before in my NFL career that I thought was really interesting. And obviously I see why, because you try to have every advantage you can in the game that's legal. Think about the uh, Super Bowl against Atlanta. Right. So we're going against Atlanta in the Super Bowl, and this is when Julio Jones has like 250 yards against Green Bay in the NFC Championship and just the best player on the planet at this time in his career. Shout out to my boy Julio. And I remember he had a bad ankle or a bad foot going yeah. into that season or during that season. And he was managing his practices and his practice. So they were saying he's not practicing that many days because of his foot. So we went into the game plan in Atlanta, shadowing him to his good foot, meaning that he can only make breaks off his right foot. So when he's on this side of the formation, we'll, we'll cover these routes, not thinking that he can break off his other foot as efficiently. So we honestly played leverage versus a guy based off his injured ankle he proved us wrong. He made four spectacular catches that game. If you go back and look at that Super Bowl, but he was only targeted four times. And that was the least amount of targets he had all season. And maybe he should have threw the ball to him more knowing what, what they know. But I think it ended up us getting a Super Bowl victory. You were teammates with Brady last season. You also, in his last New England game, pick six against him. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's not a ton of a, a, a sample, but um, last year, when you were with him, did you get a sense during it? Could you kind of sense, because you're a veteran player, a thoughtful yeah. player, this feels like it. I thought the way that the team was constructed of them winning a Super Bowl a few years earlier and running it all back roster-wise, that Tampa was only built for so long in terms of the amount of veterans, the amount of money being spent, um, the amount of weapons on that side of the ball for Brady. So there was some finality in the season, but I think just knowing how he was interacting with his family, his kids in terms of really wanting to uh, spend time with his kids and be there with his kids, that was a little different uh, because his kids were older. And I think, you know, the stuff that was going on off the field and on the field, I think was weighing on him a little bit as obviously we're all humans. So I can knew that there was going to be some type of break after the season. Now, whether that be return or not, he wouldn't, he wouldn't tell me. No one could tell you that you got to ask that man himself, but you know there was some finality to the end of that season. Was that the last time we saw Brady in a Bucks jersey? Was the last time we saw Tom Brady play football in general? And I think it's yeah. going to be the last time we see him play football. So hard knocks with the Jets appears inevitable. Um, years ago, I thought HBO was really important. This is not a shot at HBO, but to, to get behind the scenes stuff, 10 years ago, HBO was valuable. Now it's IG, it's Snap, it's Twitter. Yeah. I, I just, I, if I want to know about you, I can go to all your stuff. Um, I think it's a bit, um, I, I've said, if your if your relationship's rocky, it'll get in a divorce attorney. It won't turn a good marriage to a bad one. But New York's got an impulsive owner, coach on the hot seat, prickly old quarterback, intense <laughs> media market, brutal early schedule, a bunch of new stuff. I don't love hard knocks on this. Your takeaway, I did. I just feels like okay. Can you pick the Bears? Do, do you right. have to go after Aaron? Aaron's going to be have enough vultures circling him anywhere. Anyway. I think people want to see Aaron Rodgers behind the scenes. I think they want to see, you know, I think it's one of the most intriguing stories of the offseason, 100% Aaron Rodgers going to the Jets. So 
I think people want to see more of that. Now, what Hard Knocks can show or what they're okay being yeah. – are they going to have a camera in the quarterback room? Are we going to see all these discussions, how he interacts with Nathaniel Hackett and and even Nathaniel Hackett's story of bouncing back and, and what type of coach is he? So I think that, you know, are they able to show what they want to show? Because back in the day, they used to show guys getting cut and people remember – Devontae Davis, oh, yeah. you know, stuff. And that was some real life stuff going on. They dramatized it and made it almost like for for viewers to see, like almost story time. So I don't know if they're allowed to show that stuff anymore. So we'll see what they're allowed to show. But I think it would be pretty intriguing. Uh, you also, uh, did you, you picked off Rodgers last year, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. week three. Yeah. Oh, so so you're, you're the last guy to pick off Brady <laughs> as a Patriot. And then it was uh, Rodgers week three. T- take our audience into this. Um, oh, do we have a picture of it? Hold on, let's see. There we go, baby. Look at that. <laughs> um, was playing Aaron different than Tom? What were the differences as a DB? I would say the differences with a DB is that the extended plays that – so Tom, what, what he'll do is situationally he'll extend plays, but he's not as athletic as Aaron. Right. Right? So he'll, he's really good in the pocket. He's getting that thing out really quickly, efficiently, knowing the weaknesses of the defense, picking on the worst DB on the field, a lot like Peyton Manning would play. Right? I think Tom's Find better. the weak spot. Right. Find Tom. the weak spot. Get it out. Tom's better at that. If you reverse engineer that, I have a good idea where the ball is going based on us knowing our weak spot of the defense. So I have a good feel. Aaron Rodgers goes rogue a little bit more. He, he'll double back three times, throw the ball 70 yards over your head. <laughs> and a lot of the Green Bay system was very simple, but then they'll double move everything. So Devontae Adams will run slant, 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 then a sluggo. Or it'll be third and three, and he'll take a – 60-yard go ball in third and three, you're thinking it's going to be a five-yard hitch. So Aaron was able to kind of go off uh, off package a little bit, a little more, almost like Ben Roethlisberger and extend plays, and then those receivers will just run fire drill routes, which is backyard football. And there'll be a little bit more backyard football playing Aaron than it is playing Tom. A lot of young quarterbacks in this league now, some really special ones. Um, Trevor Lawrence, Herbert, Burrow, um, Jalen Hurts has emerged, yeah. Mahomes. Of all the young ones you've sampled, um, what do you see out there? Is there some like Jalen Hurts to me? I've said it before. I never saw him being this dominant. Yeah, I didn't think he was a great thrower in college. Uh, hard worker, kind of an aspirational personality. Um, I think he got a really good O line, which certainly helped him to grow. Um, g- g- give me a rundown on a couple of them you faced in your thoughts. Well, I think Jalen Hurts, like you said, I don't think any of us thought. He would have the career he's had thus far. I don't think any of us thought he was a great thrower coming out. Um, but he's a winner at every level. And winning winning is a trait. Winning matters. He inspires the men around him. Um, he won in college. Obviously, you saw the national championship game. Goes to Oklahoma. What does he do? Win a Heisman. Goes, sits the bench behind Carson Wentz. Wins that job. And then wins over the Philly fan base. And it's right. hard to win over Philly. Yeah. And he's done that. Great offense line. But Carson Wentz had a great offense line, too. And I, I think that he's... He does what they're asking him to do, and he gets the best out of his receivers. He's getting A.J. and Devontae to play at a really high level. I like Joe Burrow, man. Joe Burrow has this Brady-esque feel about him yep. where he has just ultimate quiet confidence and poise. You know, you don't know. It's kind of like everyone's going to show you how hard they're working, but Joe Burrow doesn't show you how hard he's working. You know he's in the facility, but you don't know how many hours because he doesn't tell you. He's truly working behind the scenes because he has that true confidence about him. Inner confidence. Right. He's not doing it for – likes and followers and then pat mahomes just has that innate ability obviously to win and he's that he's that new age aaron Rodgers, and where he's just but he's winning at a high high level and him and andy Reid, i mean are just a great combination of play calling and quarterbacking and thinking the same um one of the things that's interesting that you noted during the break is the eagles cowboys and giants washington last year had a little easier schedules the the eagles schedule this year is a gauntlet. The Giants may be the hardest in the league. Yeah. Travel. Um, so um, you think per- perhaps is that division, although Philly's still loaded, um, pulls back a little? What do yeah. you make of the Giants, for instance? Yeah, I think the Giants got to figure out their Saquon situation because he is 100% the best player on that team and needed on that team to, to have success. I, I just don't think they work without Saquon, without that threat in the backfield and even as a receiver and the loaded boxes that they see and the play action passer with Daniel Jones is a great play action passer. It's because of the attention that Saquon draws. So it's like the Tennessee Titans not having Derrick Henry. It doesn't work the same for Tannehill and the, and the group. 
So I, I can see that. I think the, the schedule is they're going to have a harder schedule this year. Obviously, they were better last year. They'll face tougher opponents, bigger primetime games. So it'll be, uh, it'll, be, it'll be tougher on that division as a whole. I think Dallas is good. Dallas, I think, um, hasn't gotten worse, right? I think the Eagles haven't gotten any worse. And the Giants are trying to load up as well. So that's three teams. And in Washington, I think they drafted well. So we'll see what their quarterback situation looks like. But I can see, even when your division is better, that then you're beating up on each other. So I can see that, div- that division as a whole going through it a little bit. We talk about the NBA draft where kids come into the league at 18, 19, 20. A lot of them are just overwhelmed. None of them are emotionally and physically combined, ready to play. European guys are a bit more mature because they play against men. Right. But even even Wemby, it, it's a lot. You go to a new country, you're the star. Mm-hmm. NFL guys come out with three or four years of college. So you generally get somebody, at least emotionally, a, a little more stable. Often guys come in married, you know, like, like relationship-wise. How long, in the NBA, um, because they come in so early, it's harder to draft, I think. In the NFL, I got three, four years of tape. Like, I can see what you can do and what you can't do. Yet, half the league is undrafted. (laughs) How long for you in your NFL career? And maybe you can give me good examples. Before, how many practices where you looked at a rookie and went, wow, or, oh, that that, that ain't going to work in this league? Yeah. I mean, I knew, I remember A.J. Brown as a guy. I remember A.J. Brown coming in, and he was already built, Big. right? And I just remember how he caught the ball with his hands. And I was like, he's the best catcher on our team day one, like of physically catching the ball. Just, just you know how A.J. Brown catches the ball. He snags the ball. Snags he doesn't body it. catch the ball ever. Right. You see him snag the ball. He tracks the ball over his shoulder. He was doing that day one. And I remember we were on him a lot. We had a veteran secondary, me, Kevin Byard, Malcolm Butler, Dory Jackson there in Tennessee. And we would, we would you know, come at him and practice and stuff because he, he knew he was good type thing. So we were kind of on him a lot. But he already had that in him. And it was like, all right, just a matter of time for this guy. Like he walked in, was walk-in ready. Other guys, I think the NFL season, there's every individual player is, is faced with so much adversity individually or as a team, training camp. You might roll your ankle day two. Now you're out there with a sprained ankle for two weeks of training camp. You're hitting the preseason games. And then you go you know, right into the regular season. It's a double college schedule, what you're used to. So guys break down, and how they handle that is truly midway through their rookie year, how they kind of handle that last half of the season. Like, oh, this guy's going to be special because their routine stays the same. They're still going to the lifts. They're still lifting weight. They're not skipping everything. They're not in the training room 90% of the time. So how they handle those little nicks and bruises is really going to see – what type of pro they are. Cause you need a, every professional athlete needs to have that structure and that discipline yes. of a routine. So they can maintain their routine. I know they'll be pretty successful. So, um, you know, we were talking about this earlier is that, um, it's, it's 55 men in your locker room scout team, even the coaches, there's a lot of alpha. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I want my <laughs> players to be confident, right? Not delusional, but if you're close, I'm okay with it, especially corner. Oh yeah, I you got to be a short memory, bro. You're gonna get burned. Like wide receiver, you got to believe you can beat your guy. So there are positions, receiver, corner. Like I, I'm almost, I'm okay with a little delusion. But we we talked about the Stephon Diggs drama in Buffalo. So I went back and I looked at Des Bryant, who I thought was a bit disruptive. I didn't count OBJ. I don't think he's disruptive. I thought he was great in Cleveland, great with the Rams, great in college, fine with New York early. New York gobbled him up for a few hours. It's okay. But I looked at Antonio Brown, Des Bryant, and Stephon. Kind of disruptive. In all cases, four total seasons, three guys. They were easily the most targeted receiver. Like, not close. I mean, Antonio Brown had like 330 targets. And yet, all three receivers, like, you're not getting me the ball. In all your year, and my takeaway is, I've worked with people. You feed, you feed, you feed. Low and they're just not happy. And And I look at Stephon and I'm like, bro, Minnesota Buffalo, you're getting a lot of looks. It, it, all your years, a decade in the league, are there players that are just really hard to coach? And and I don't know if it's high maintenance. But you tell me. Is if every locker room you've been in, have there been a couple of guys that sometimes you just roll your eyes and go, "This is this guy's hard." Yeah, I think there has. I mean, I've been like you said, these you know playing for Belichick and some of these you know Rabels very similar. They kind of rid that, you know. They kind of, they kind of, they kind of police that as a head coach because if you don't police it, you police it as a player, right? But if your head coach isn't doing anything about it, now there's now there's separation of classes because like he's getting coached differently than the rest of us. 
So I haven't seen too much of that, but I do know that to be a number one, to be a number one corner, a number one left tackle, a number one uh, receiver, there is some delusion. You need to feel like you're that guy and you're him, right? That's the way everyone says nowadays, I'm him, I'm him. But you also got to know your role on the team and you have to be a good teammate first because at the end of the day, to win a Super Bowl, to win a championship, it's filled of great teammates. And I think like the Kansas City Chiefs, Right, I don't know if they had a number one. Travis Kelsey's their number one. Yeah, but I think he celebrates. Other, watch how he celebrates when other people score. You know, I think he's happy for other people's success. So, Stephon Diggs can want the ball as much as he wants, but is he happy when other guys get the ball? I think he is. I, I think some of it could be overplayed. I don't know the the actual details. I'm not going to speak on the details of the nuance of the drama, but as long as it's understood, that's him and he's going to be him. And um, Josh Allen's okay with that, and they can handle it internally. Then let them handle it internally because it is. It is a long season. There will there will be some bumps and scuffles and butting heads of brothers, of teammates. And I think as long as they all want the common goal of winning, then that's all that matters. That needs to be the common goal. If it's about individual success and not – if it's about targets and receptions and not about winning, then, you know, there's a problem. But if you're frustrated from losing, um, then you got to be productive in, in how you change that. Do you have a teammate in your 10 years that you were closest to? Like maybe it was just a great teammate, a good friend, but – you know, it's like I was reading a story about actors recently, and an actor said, uh, you know, you're acting in a movie. It could be a love interest or a best friend, and you're really into the character, and you're on a set for nine months. Right. And then the movie ends, and you're like, oh, we're not really friends. And, <laughs> and the actor said, it screwed with my head for years. I'm like, we were so close. And in, it's sort of the same way in sports. You get traded. You get oh, moved. Yeah. Do you have a teammate today that is a brother for life, that is a friend for life, that's somebody that's just an ally that you've connected with? There's a, there's a few. I, I would say the McCourty twins and all that because of Rutgers connection, right? I played with Devin and them, and I've known them since I was, what? I've known them since I was 17, 18 years old recruiting to Rutgers, right? So they're like a big brother figure. But I would say in this in this league, a friend that I didn't know before I got in, a teammate, would be Kevin Byard. I think in Tennessee – me and him really like would sit there and talk like, man, I, I want I want fans to pack these stadiums. I want us to be great. Like we have Derek, a young Derek, and we have so and so. We have this guy. Like we can be really good. And we worked really hard and saw the success of the Titans kind of skyrocket out of nowhere. You would right. almost say the Tennessee Titans as a franchise. They're number one seed in AFC, AFC championship. Kevin Byard's having Hall of Fame type numbers year in, year out, getting overlooked. And we would just talk and work behind the scenes. And that's a guy that from this day, we probably talk every other day to, you know, weekly where we have multiple kids, we have wives, we're traveling, we're busy, but we always stay in touch. I've played on two separate teams since Tennessee and he's still there and we still talk. So I think that's a friend that I made in this league because of our similar competitive um, attitudes and how we go about our work as professionals. We appreciate each other's work. Obviously we were teammates and we just continue to push each other. Uh, Logan Ryan, you could do this, you know. You should be into this space. <laughs> this space is good. You never get hit. Yeah, exactly. Ever. No exactly. Two days. We don't even do one a days. Hey, I appreciate, you know, just chatting it up with you and learning from the greats like you, and uh, we'll, we'll see you one day. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.